the Emperor of Mankind studied the machine. These remarkable and terrible beings had contributed to the downfall of a civilization far more advanced than his nascent Imperium. And yet, he had chained them, bound them to his will. Now, they would serve the Imperium of Man. They would need guardians, but who, amongst his incredible sons and their legions, should control such a force? There was only one choice. The first. In the long list of things that make up the Emperor of Mankind's questionable parenting tactics is the fact that when it came time to distribute gifts amongst the Primarchs, he gave most of them to the Lion. It's said that the arsenal of the Dark Angels was more dangerous than any other legion and rivaled that of the Legio Custodes. The reason for this is largely to do with the Lion's purpose. All the Primarchs had a purpose, and it's often been wondered what is the difference between Lehman Russ and Lionel Johnson in this regard. Both of them are exceptional warriors, incredibly loyal to the Emperor, and socially pretty awkward. But the difference between them is actually quite simple. If a planet rebelled against the Imperium and the Emperor wanted an example to be made, he'd send the Space Wolves. They'd descend with such a fury that everyone in the galaxy would know not to mess with the Emperor. However, if the Emperor decided that no trace of this people should remain, he'd send the Dark Angels. And then everyone in the galaxy would go, hey, wasn't there a planet there? The Lion is the Emperor's exterminator, and this role is said to have been so important, it's actually the reason the Lion was created first. So to accomplish this goal, he gave the Dark Angels various relics and weapons from Old Knight, and this included the Exindio, literal men of iron. I'd also assume included was various tanks and other military vehicles. Which is a hell of a coincidence because this video is sponsored by War Thunder, the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever created. Play more than 2,000 tanks, planes, helicopters and ships in dynamic combined arms PvP battles. The collection of vehicles in War Thunder spans over 100 years of development, from the 1920s to the present day. Every vehicle is incredibly detailed and modelled, down to their individual components, offering a highly immersive combat experience. And you can customise your vehicles further, apply hundreds of camouflages, place historical markings anywhere on your machines, as well as 3D decorations, such as bushes and equipment. I can't believe the incredible detail in this game and what you can add to your vehicles, as well as the awesome fire and smoke effects and destruction effects. Play for free now on PC, PlayStation or Xbox using the link in my description. The Mechanicum was at the heart of the Emperor's new Imperium. It supplied arms and weapons to the armies of the Great Crusade. Forge worlds were the cogs around which the wheels of conquest could turn. The Mechanicum of Mars had become essential to the Emperor's plans, but in many ways it was also the greatest threat to the Imperium in the years before the Horus Heresy. For the Mechanicum stood apart from all others in their worship of the Machine God. This put them against the order that the Emperor had established. Their rituals and creeds were in opposition to the Imperial Truth, which sought to remove the religion, faith and superstition that had been so apparent on most human worlds. Whilst the Emperor could abide this, his greatest fear was that the Mechanicum could and maybe would one day rise up and prosecute a war against him. To combat this, the Emperor crafted contingencies that were known to very few people. The Icarus Contingency was perhaps the most extreme plan from what we know today. It was issued to Lionel Johnson, Primarch of the Dark Angels, the First Legion. Within this, there were two key clauses. Should the Lion will it, the Dark Angels would conduct pre-emptive combat operations to neutralize elements of the Mechanicum deemed to have become contrary to the needs of the Imperium. 
This has been invoked eight times throughout the history of the Imperium. The other clause was an Imperial warrant allowing the Dark Angels to maintain and use a number of relics from Old Night or the Age of Strife. This technology was forbidden in all other areas of the Imperium, including within the Lion's Brothers Legions. The relics gifted by the Emperor to the Lion were often specifically chosen to be useful against the Mechanicum, as they would be resistant to the Technomagi and anathematic to their machines of war. These gifts included the Exindio class automata, towering metal behemoths cast in an inhuman mold to be unleashed only when absolutely necessary. They are the tortured and neutered remains of a Dark Age artificial intelligence. The last of the dreaded Silica Anima, the bastard offspring of the Men of Iron, chained to the service of the Master of Mankind, and later, the First Legion. The Men of Iron were an artificial intelligence created during humanity's Dark Age of Technology, the zenith of our scientific knowledge. They were designed to serve humanity in many capacities, including war. Yet, they turned on their creators in the 23rd millennium and an apocalyptic war followed. It was only ended by an alliance of galactic powers. The Men of Iron were considered defeated, yet their impact is still felt today, as artificial intelligence or abominable intelligence is banned throughout the Imperium. At the time of the Great Crusade, humanity's memory still preserved tales of these creatures, these nightmares from old night. Therefore, widespread knowledge of the Exindio's existence would terrify many within the Imperium. Most of the time, they were kept hidden on the Dark Angel's homeworld of Caliban, in its forbidden vaults, only brought forth to counter the most abhorrent of threats. The Dark Angels always had a unique structure to their legion. After the Lion was found by the Emperor, they operated with six specialized wings. The Dreadwing, the Deathwing, the Ravenwing, the Stormwing, the Firewing, and the Ironwing. Only the most senior Forge Rites of the Ironwing, the wing dedicated to the use of overwhelming fire on the battlefield, knew of the existence of the Exindio class automata. Neutered as they were, they were still fearsome combatants. They did not understand mercy or restraint, and would attack with a maelstrom of churning claws, arcane fire, and gouts of radiation blasts. There are three main stories that cover the deployment of the Exindio in some detail. The first is set during the Great Crusade. The Dark Angels were sent to investigate strange happenstances on the Imperial world of Muspel. It became clear that the cause of this was the Crave, psychic xenoforms of tremendous power, able to enslave organisms to their will. And their lord was soon to arrive, the first of their kind, the Autochthonar. Force enough to flay the souls of 10,000 men crackled unspent across its withered carapace. It predated even the Eldari, and was spawned by an evil to be a living weapon so it could spread anguish and terror amongst the sentient races. It had learned how to reproduce, outlived its long forgotten creators, and thrived in a galaxy ripe with chaos and strife. When the Autochthonar's ship arrived in the system, L. Johnson and a small force of elite Dark Angels teleported aboard. They fought their way through the Crave Hordes until the Primarch stood before this ancient being. Something so old, humanity's entire evolution was but a footnote in its existence. The monster tore into his mind. The Primarch gritted his teeth and the Lion Sword, and slowly forced the tendrils back. Subordinate Crave emerge and pounce on the Primarch, and he is stunned by a powerful psychic attack, then held in place by two of the Crave. The Autochthonar approached with jittering movements, as if through a string of micro-teleportation events rather than inconveniencing its mummified limbs. As it drew nearer, the subordinate Crave faded into darkness, individual shadows banished from sight, if not from true existence, by a total eclipse of the sun. 
all except the two that held the lion. I will avoid your mind. I will force down every morsel of knowledge and personality you possess. And when your empire falls, as every empire has fallen before it, then I will be there to feast on its corpse, Lion L. Johnson. Before the lion could respond, the crave holding onto his right arm exploded into shards of chitin and Icarus spray. Death was so immediate, so unexpected and total, that the crave did not even have time for a mortis shriek. It simply ended. With his sword arm free, the lion turned and plunged the humming artificer blade into the thorax of the rondel spined crave to his left. Stenius strode into the central nexus. The Knight of the Iron Wing had been outfitted with a psychically baffled helmet of the Santalis Order and was flanked by a pair of towering six-limbed cyber automata. Adamantium-clad behemoths of inhuman aspect and devilish asymmetry. The things advanced ahead of the legionary, as though directly from the techno-horrified imaginings of old knight. The lion sensed the ripples in the ether, as the crave or Tokthana unfold its mind towards them, only to have its thoughts rebuffed by logic processes of copper, silicon, and steel. You cannot fight what you cannot see, said the lion, launching himself at the wizened Xenos as the two Exindio Automata deployed their weapons. In order to keep these shackled AIs controlled, Stenius of the Iron Wing had his hand constantly over an artificial kill switch. Otherwise, the Exindio may well have torn straight through the Lion and his Deathwing bodyguards. At the same time as this engagement, on Musmel, the Dark Angels were engaged with a Crave Titan and brought it down with an atomic blast. The death of the Xenos Titan caused a psychic backlash that ran through the Crave's collective psyche. The Monster Slayer of Caliban had known it would, and this sent the Autochthonar's body into spasm, allowing the Lion to end this monster. It is possible that the Imperium of my father will one day falter, as you insist it must. As I still draw breath, it shall not, and you shall never know. Even just two Exindio proved them worth that day. Against some of the most ancient and powerful Xenos the Imperium has ever encountered. They would be deployed again during the Horus Heresy, in the Thramus Crusade. On the planet of Galatia, in the Triplex system, the Dark Angels would fight against forces that would one day become known as the Dark Mechanicum. Galatia and its sister planet Fool had long experimented with forbidden technologies and dark theorem, subverting the rule of Mars to increase its own power unnoticed at the very edge of the Imperium. And now, as the Dark Angels brought them to the brink of destruction, they unleashed that power openly. Towering automata of unknown design punched holes in reality with arcane beam weapons and unleashed raw warp energy upon the Emperor's Angels of Death. Here, Lionel Johnson invoked the ancient Icarus contingency and instructed the Masters of the Armory to awaken the Exindio that slumbered in the deepest stasis vaults of his flagship, the Invincible Reason. He ordered the remaining Dark Angels to withdraw on Galatia, and a section of the Invincible Reason's lower hull detached, and crashed down onto the planet like a drop pod. Twelve Nightmares stepped out. They had been gifted to the Lion in case Mars had been foolish enough to turn on the Emperor, and now they had found the perfect prey. Their neural cores were immune to the crude cybertheurgy of the Mechanicum, and the Exindio tore into the creations of the fallen Magi. The traitorous automata were stumbling efforts by the cult on Galatia to understand the forbidden arts that had forged the Men of Iron. Therefore, they were no match for the First Legion's Exindio. Into the hellish battlefield of screeching automata and whirling metal monsters strode the lion, 
The one creature that even the Exindio, whose hatred for all organic life knew no bounds, refused to oppose. He sought the head of the serpent, the commander of Galatia's forces. The lion faced the greatest of the fallen Magi's creations as it stood warden over the sealed salvation vaults of the Galatian Archmagi. A huge multi-limbed construct of brass and steel loomed over the Primarch. Its tail primed with arcane weapons and scythe-bladed claws reaching for the Lord of Caliban. A monster greater even than the beasts of that distant world. There are few tales of what would follow. For on this battlefield, no mortal human could survive. It was the haunt of demons and gods alone. What is known is that when the Dark Angels returned to the field of battle, as the sun grew dim and night fell on Galatia, Lion L. Johnson stood alone amongst a field of metal corpses and the dormant shells of the surviving Seven Exindio, whose limited power reserves had run dry and plunged them back into a stasis of torpor. Galatia would be purged by the Dark Angels, but their true foe in the Thramus Crusade had not been dealt with. The Night Lords and their Primarch, Conrad Kurz. The Dark Angels and the Night Lords would battle on the planet Crucible, and whilst the Night Haunter caused absolute carnage, the Lion was strangely absent. The surviving Dark Angels host had fallen back, whilst the Night Lords commanders exulted in their apparent victory. However, ever jealous of each other, they fell to bickering on the battlefield over the shares of the spoils and fighting even broke out between rivaling retinues. It was at this point that the Lion played his final trump card, the last strategy that offered him a hope of victory in the face of such odds. He unleashed the Exindio once more. Yet, rather than set them loose upon the battlefield haphazardly, he had a specific task for the terrors of Old Knight. He set them upon his brother, on Conrad Kurz himself. Even seven such monsters could not defeat the Night Haunter, but they were enough to keep him at bay and occupied on the edge of the fighting. A flailing storm of destruction whose manic hate was a match for that of the Night Haunter. As those two forces of destruction met, the Lion finally revealed himself, striding forth at the head of the Deathwing companions in their distinct bone white armor. He fell upon the disorganized commanders of the Night Lords and set them to flight. Those foolish enough to stand against the Lion fell before his blade, and those that fled threw their warriors into confusion. It was a grand opening in the Horde, one which the Dark Angels committed themselves to in their entirety, abandoning the fortification to the Night Watch and surging forwards in the attack. The two sides met in a furious clash of arms, the Dark Angels few in number but focused and led by their Primarch, the Night Lords ill-disciplined but ferocious and many. With support from arriving White Scars, the Dark Angels would win the day, however the Night Lords were not yet dealt with. Kurz would be dragged from the battlefield, screaming for his brother to face him, a chance he would get multiple times during the heresy. It might seem like a big sacrifice to lose the Exindio in order to just distract the Night Haunter. However, this gamble really paid off for the Lion. Though Kurz would continue to cause havoc for those loyal to the Emperor throughout the Heresy, the Night Lord's Legion would never fully recover from this defeat, as they lost three quarters of the Marines sent to Crucible. And that marks the end of this video and the tale of the Exindio. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to check out War Thunder through the link in my description, and for a limited time only you'll also get a large bonus pack. This includes multiple premium vehicles, a premium account, an exclusive 3D decorator for your vehicles, and much more. If you enjoyed this video, please do like and subscribe, and if you want to help me make more of this kind of content, please consider supporting the channel through the join button on the page below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you next time.